All right, welcome everybody. Um, if you can hear the sound of my voice, raise your hand. There's a go to webinar hand raising control panel. Very good, thank you. Some people figure that out quickly. Very good. All right, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Michael Devlin, and um, I'm a real estate broker. And this is a um, a presentation about how to launch a successful real estate career. We're going to look at some of the questions will be, is real estate right for you? Um, what do you need to do to get started? In fact, let me make sure I get my thing working here. Uh, we're going to cover three topics. One of them is why real estate and also why now? Um, if you are willing to participate in with if you're willing to take time off on your Monday evening to participate in, well, something like this, it's usually because you're looking for something new, something different, hopefully better in your business or professional life. I'm assuming that's why you, you're here. And if you're looking for something different and better in your professional or business life, the question would be, why would you get into real estate? What exactly do you have to do to be successful? How much money can you make? What would a day look like if you were a real estate agent? The other topic we're going to talk about is how to choose an office to affiliate with. If you've decided you want to get into real estate, the next question is with whom? There are different kinds of real estate companies. They operate and are structured differently. And we'll look at some of the things that would be important in, in terms of picking one. And finally, in how to get started, we're going to cover what do you need to do to get a real estate license? Um, how long does all of this process take? How much does all of this cost? I hope that's pretty close to what you were interested in hearing because, well, you know, that's what I'm going to talk about. So let's start with the subject of why real estate. I like to begin with a few definitions. There are the words, for example, broker and salesperson. Now, those two terms refer to two different kinds of real estate licenses. You could have either a real estate broker's license or you could have a real estate salesperson's license. From a practical point of view, there's not a big difference. In other words, a real estate salesperson can do everything that a real estate broker can do with two exceptions. Right. There's two things that you can do if you have a broker's license that you can't do if you have a salesperson's license. Number one is you can be independent. Real estate salespeople have to work for brokers, but brokers don't have to work for brokers. Brokers can be independent. The second thing you could do with a broker's license is, well, you could brag about it. You could tell everybody that you've got the advanced license, the graduate license, the executive license, right? Uh, most people, by the way, won't have any idea what you're talking about or particularly care. So we're going to start by talking about how to become a real estate salesperson. You can't become a real estate broker in California or for that matter in most states until you actually have real estate experience. In California, you need two years full-time experience in real estate or four years part-time experience in real estate in the past five years. Now, that doesn't mean you can get a real estate license, wait two years and become a broker. You need two years full time real estate experience and they want to know how many transactions you've done and it has to be signed off. So we're going to focus on being a salesperson. Then there's the word agent. And if you see a person, you might say, oh, that's a real estate agent. He's a real estate agent. She's a real estate agent. But technically, the word agent is different from broker or salesperson because the word agent really refers to a relationship where you have one person who's called the principal who hires another person who's called the agent and that agent represents the principal in dealing with third parties. In other words, it's a principal and agent and a third party. If there's no third party, then there is no agency. Now, a way in which this comes up, I get asked this question a lot from people that are in the process of getting into real estate or people that are in real estate. And the question is, if I decide to buy a house for myself or sell a property that I own, can I be my own agent, right? I've been asked that question many times and technically, legally, the answer is no, no, you can't. Why can't you be your own agent? Because by definition, the word agent means that you're representing somebody else, not yourself. If you're representing yourself, you're not an agent. You're a principal in the transaction. 
And by the way, that is a very accurate and somewhat technical answer to the question, can I be my own agent? However, I understand that I did not answer the question they were really asking me. The question they were really asking me was, if I get my real estate license, could I buy or sell real estate for myself and not have to pay a commission? That's the question I was really being asked. Um, and the answer is yes, you can do that and not have to pay a commission, but that's not because you're an agent in the transaction, it's because you're a licensee. And if you have a real estate broker's license or a real estate salesperson's license, it's possible to save money when you're buying and selling for yourself on the commission because of that professional status. But you're still not an agent if you're buying a house for yourself. And then there's the word realtor. And the word realtor is a copyrighted designation of the National Association of Realtors, which is a trade association, which is, it's kind of like a union right? They hate to be called that, but it's kind of like a union. I mean, think of the, the Teamsters Union as an example. Now, the Teamsters Union, among other things, truck drivers could be a member of the Teamsters Union. If I want to drive trucks commercially, am I required to join that union? And the answer is no, no, I don't have to join the union. What do I need? I need the license, right? If I have the right license, I can drive trucks. Might I choose to join the union? There's some jobs you won't get if you're not a member of the union. There's training programs and job fairs and insurance programs. You get the idea. So in real estate, the union is called the National Association of Realtors. And then there's a California or state association and then there are local associations. If you join that, you have become a realtor. So the word realtor is kind of like the word teamster, right? You understand it means you're a member of the union. Um, so you can be a licensee and you can be a salesperson and you can be an agent, but not necessarily a realtor. And I'll explain later why you would or not want to become a member of the union and what that might cost. So what can you do if you get a real estate license? Um, I'm expanding my list because there's more things to do, but let's just talk about the core things that you can do as a licensee in the state of California and get paid a commission. You probably already know that you could help somebody buy or sell residential property and get paid a commission. I also get asked by people, I get people that say, look, I don't want to sell homes. Right? I don't want to work evenings and weekends. I don't want to deal with families and all that. Business people during business hours, that's all I want. Commercial real estate, that's for me. How do I get a commercial real estate license? And the answer is there's no such thing. There's just a real estate license. And if you have a real estate license, you could do residential and you could do commercial and you could even do loans. Now, in, there are other ways to be a loan agent other than getting a real estate license, but a mortgage broker is a real estate broker. And the people that work for the mortgage broker have real estate licenses. Now, in addition to getting the license, they have to take another course and pass another exam and pay another fee and get their license endorsed as a mortgage loan originator, but you have to start with a real estate license. Another thing you can do with a real estate license is property management. Um, and property management isn't just like managing apartment buildings and things like that, but a lot of times investors that are buying duplexes and fourplexes or even some single family homes want somebody to run the ads and talk to the tenants and screen them and get the calls and do all that, right? And that also requires a real estate license. And selling a business, even when real property is not involved, is another area that real estate licensees can be involved in and earn a commission. Now, the example I use is, let's say you want to buy a hardware store. So rather than starting your own hardware store from scratch, you find an existing hardware store, a little neighborhood hardware store. It's called Harry's Hardware. And Harry is, is, is tired of the hardware business and is retiring. And so you buy Harry's Hardware Store from Harry. Now, Harry probably doesn't own the building and doesn't own the land that the hardware store is on. Harry's a tenant. 
So when you bought the hardware store, you're not actually buying real property, you're buying personal property. And you could do this and get a commission with either a personal property broker's license or a real estate license, right? So if you have a real estate license, you can be paid a commission for selling a business even when real estate is not involved in the sale. We're gonna primarily talk about residential and commercial today. So ways of having a real estate license, you could either work for a broker or not work for a broker, but you, you, you need a broker to work, right? Now, I have to admit this, this seems confusing to me at times when I look at this slide, but this is where I'm going with this. People say to me, you know, I've always been told I ought to be in real estate. I've always liked real estate. I've always wanted to get into real estate, but I really don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know who I'm going to work for, and I don't know what I'm going to do when I'm in the business. I just don't know. So is it possible for me to get my real estate license without having to make all those decisions? And the answer is yes. You can go get your license, take the exam, pass the exam, and get a license and not have a broker and your license would be issued in what's called a non-working status, all right? Now, a non-working real estate license, well, it's a lot like a non-working car, right? You, you understand you have it at home and it's in the garage and when friends are over, you can show them the car, right? They can sit in it and, you know, play around with, but when they say, hey, this looks great, can we go for a ride? You have to say, no, 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 we can't do that. It's not a working car, right? So you can have a real estate license and keep it and renew it and keep it forever without ever activating it with a broker. However, you can't do anything or earn a commission You can't from anything that requires a license unless you do have a broker. But you can get the license without making that decision. So why are people you know, interested in real estate? Why? Probably the biggest reason I've heard is freedom and independence. You know, I hear this a lot. And for me, it's been a long time, but uh, a long time ago, let's just say, I used to work for a very odd company. They were very strange, right? And, uh, and one of the weird things that this company did is they told us what time we had to be at work each day. I mean, it, it was like it was some sort of a rule. You know, everyone had to show up at a particular time. Right, and then they would let us know when we could go on a break and when was lunch and when was lunch over and when was the other break and okay, now you can go home. I believe that arrangement is called a job. I think that's what that's called, a J-O-B, right? The journey of the broke. Well, being in real estate is not like having a job. You can look around offices and real estate, opening the cabinets and the cupboards and looking behind all the doors. And what you will not find are time clocks for our associates to punch. You understand the, the we're not going to call you at 10 o'clock in the morning and say, hey, where are you? Right. You understand? It's not that kind of a deal. So the relationship that we have with the other associates is not like an employer to an employee kind of relationship. It's like a business advisor or a business consultant to a business owner. And the people that are most successful in real estate are people that have always wanted to have their own business. And by the way, it wouldn't hurt if you had some business acumen. Now that doesn't mean you had to have business experience, right? All of this can be taught and learned, but you want to, you need to want to have your own business in order for this to work very well. By the way, guess what one of the biggest disadvantages are, is to being in the real estate business, one of the biggest disadvantages. And for many people, it's freedom and independence because freedom is a gift. Well, it's not always wisely used, let's just say. You know, there's a story of the guy in the in Silicon Valley. He starts at a big tech company. First day on the job, he's meeting everybody. And in the lunch area, he's sitting with this guy who apparently has been there forever, right? And that guy's telling him everything about what's going on and what's different and where they're moving and what to do and all this sort of stuff. And so finally, the newcomer says to the old timer, wow, thank you for sharing all that. How long have you worked for this company? And the old timer says, ever since they threatened to fire me. Right? 
that's when I started working. Hey, have you ever met people like that? They work just enough so that they don't get fired, right? And then the company pays them just enough so they don't quit. And then they work out this sort of a sick relationship. Yeah. So I'm going to say it plainly. Real estate is a non-salaried, commission-only profession. Non-salaried, commission-only. It can be a very high-paying, hard job. And it can be a very low-paying, easy one as well. Speaking about high paying, hard jobs, what would be the uh, one reason that people are interested in real estate or because of the financial rewards? Now, um, I'm in Silicon Valley and where you are, it, it may be different. We're, we're, we're special in Silicon Valley. And one of the things that makes us special is, is that a selling a, a property at $1 million is not a big deal. Right, the median price of a single family home in Santa Clara County last month was over 1.4 million. Right, less so for condos and townhomes, but a million dollars, it's a nice round number. And if you're in an area where the median price is 500,000, uh, divide by two, right? You know, and if you're uh, in some areas, it's 250,000, well, divide by four. So I'll give you an example. If you were to sell a house and it was a $1 million property, the amount of commission that would be paid, thats it's not chiseled in stone, it's not set by law, and it can be negotiated between the broker and the seller. In, in many cases, it's 6%. However, let's just say, just for number purposes, the total commission was only five. Now, if there's a 5% commission on a million dollar sale, gross commission for both sides, the 5%, that would be $50,000. In real estate, there's usually two sides to the transaction. I guess there's always two sides. There's a buyer and a seller. And in the, in the transaction, typically they are represented by two different real estate offices. And although it doesn't have to be this way, the most common arrangement would be the brokers would split that $50,000 50-50. That means that each office gross would be $25,000. Now we'll talk about how much you get in a little bit, but let's just start with that number. $25,000 is a typical gross commission from the sale of a million dollar property in our area. So what that translates into is that if you sell one house a month, right, and they're a million dollars and it's a two and a half percent to each side, buyer side and seller side, $25,000, and you did 12 of those transactions, then you would have grossed $300,000 in commission income, $300,000. So I guess the first question for you is, could you live on that? You know, I know, I know, you'll have to cut back some, but um, but 300, now we're gonna talk about what would you need to do to get there. By the way, if you sell 40 of those homes in one year, you've grossed $1 million in commissions. And there are a lot of agents in our area that are doing more than that. We'll talk about how to get there. And I know what you're probably thinking, right? I know. It's a logical thing to think at this point. If you were to sell 40 homes and make a million dollars, you probably are concerned that you wouldn't have any idea how to spend that money, right? I'm sure that that I'm sure that was bothering you, wasn't it? Maybe, maybe you have an idea, but one of the ideas might be to invest in real estate. Have you ever heard the old line, buy land? They're not making any more of it. And if you look at how people um, retire with, with, in, with, with, with savings or wealth and assets, it's almost always through the ownership of real estate. And if you want to be a real estate investor, can you see that being in real estate gives you a big advantage? You know more about what's going on. You see properties before everybody else does. You understand financing and trends and the markets and all that stuff a lot better. So there's an old saying in real estate that we might live on our commissions, but we're gonna retire on our investments. And then finally, security. Now, 
it seems like an odd thing for an independent contractor kind of a you know the deal but i had a friend who went to san jose state studied mechanical engineering graduated uh went to work for hitachi in their hard drive division 28 and a half years he worked at hitachi and they laid him off um they said it wasn't personal right nothing personal and he knew it really wasn't personal because they shut down the department closed the division moved the entire plant now i'm not saying that he was a perfect engineer but even if he had been perfect they still would have let him go it wasn't that they said well you're not doing a good job and we don't want you anymore they decided that we don't need anybody to be doing that job here anymore do you understand how real estate because of the nature of the business is that you can fail at it you can you can fail but you really can't get fired um so if i have a question let me just get to this if the term realtor is trademarked could i still call myself a realtor on social media the answer is yes you can use the term realtor they want you to put the little circle r but only if you're a member of the union right you only you can't say realtor it'd be like going to truck stops and telling people you're a teamster and then they find out you're not right you're saying that's not 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 a good idea so in order to do that you have to be a member of the association of realtors and then you can call yourself a realtor so security just so everybody gets that wrap that up you can fail at real estate but you can't get fired all right you can fail but you can't get fired if you don't like us right you could just go to another office Right, pick up your license and go. You're an independent contractor. If you don't get along with anyone, right, you, uh, that's other issues. But let's say you just tough it out for two years, and then you can go get your broker's license. And then you don't have to work with anyone. But then I don't know. That's sort of the, the whole point. So ways of getting into the business or approaching the business. I've noticed over the years. I mean, these different categories have pretty much always existed. But I've noticed over the years recently that there's more people that are what I would call investor agents. So the investor agent is somebody who wants to be an investor in real estate and has figured out that being in real estate as an agent is a really good fit. Um, and those people generally are doing this part time, right, because they got other jobs or other things going on. But that's really their goal. A part-time agent, and there's two kinds of them, there's the permanent part-time and the transitional part-time, but the part-time agent, which I call dual career, because I don't know, I thought it sounded better. The dual career agent has another job or has another commitment, family or whatever, and they're not able to devote full-time to being in real estate. Some of them don't ever want to make the switch to full-time, because wherever they're working, that's where they're meeting all the people in the first place that they're dealing with in real estate. And if they quit, then they wouldn't have that influence sphere anymore. And then other people are doing it in a transition where their goal is to stop doing what they're doing and to do real estate full time. And by the way, we have plans for that. Tradi tra the, the ability to make the transition, uh, replace your income and all of that. Then there are full-time agents, and full-time agents generally don't have other jobs. Um, they may have some other commitments, but essentially they're working 40 hours or more in real estate. And big-time agents are people that develop their own team, their, their own following, they're opening up branches in other cities and other locations, and we can show you how to do that too. So challenges for full-time agents. First of all, this is sales, right? I'm just going to say it, right? This is sales. And in sales, you're paid essentially for talking to people. You understand that's, that's what you're paid to do when you're in the sales profession. You're paid for having conversations with people that are thinking about buying, selling, or investing in real estate. And the more people you talk to, the more you're going to get paid. If you only talk to some people about real estate, then you're going to get paid, well, some. But if you talk to a lot of people about real estate, well, then you could be paid a lot, right? It's a 
it, it, it's a, based upon the number of people that you're talking to. And one of the good things about real estate is, is that it's pretty much something everybody wants. If you were to ask yourself, you know, what percentage of the American public now or in the future will buy or sell real estate? Well, that's pretty much everyone. What that means is, is that everyone you know and everyone you meet is a potential client. So part of the job of being in sales is that you need to have conversations with those people about buying, selling, or investing in real estate and follow up with them, setting appointments and things like that. We're going to talk about that in a little bit more. So the if you you need to, people ask me sometimes, well, are you going to give me leads? We're going to give you lead generating materials. We're going to help you generate leads. We're going to help you with the technology to get people to contact you. But it is the job is for you to be having conversations with people about buying, selling, and investing in real estate. Um, you just need to understand it, it involves sales. And you might need to have some reserves. I hired an agent, went through my real estate school, started working at the company in June, right? Did an open house, met somebody at the open house. They wanted to buy the house, so they bought the house. And in July, got her first commission check. That's not typical. I'm just saying, right? So if you had your real estate license today and you met somebody today that wanted to buy or sell real estate, how long could it take before they actually buy, sell, transaction closes, and everyone gets paid? It could take a few months. It could take a few months. And so you get the idea. You might need a few months to find the people, and it might take a few months to close. Like any business, like any business, it's going to require some investment up front. We'll quantify that a little bit later, but it also will take a period of time before you get a return on that investment. However, real estate as a business requires a lot less money up front, and it's a lot shorter time to get a return than both, most businesses. If you're in residential sales, you're going to have to work evenings and weekends. Commercial, not so much. Residential, you know, there's an old line, you got to make hay when the sun shines. That means you need to be available when your clients are available, and that's usually when they're not working, which is evenings and weekends. Um, you just need to know that that's when you're going to work. Now, the advantage of that, though, there is an advantage, which is that if you have another job, that's when you would be free too but working evenings and weekends, you have to be a self-starter. You have to have self-discipline, right? You have to be motivated, right? Freedom is not always wisely used and you need to have the discipline to make a plan and stick to the plan and carry out and to execute. There's no salary, it's a commission only profession. However, you could make a million dollars. So think about the job you currently have assuming you have a job. Let's say you said you got up tomorrow morning really early, right? You had this, 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 this big epiphany and you said, oh my gosh, today is the first day of the rest of my life, right? And you go to work early, you show up early, you, you work through lunch, you stay late, you come in on Saturday, you do that for a year. How much more money are they gonna be paying you at the end of the year? And for many people, the answer is not anymore. Um, I'll, I'll get to that about the commercial in a second. Um, so um, you understand in most jobs, it wouldn't matter how hard you worked. There's just a ceiling on how much money you could possibly make. In real estate, there is no ceiling. Um, startup capital, we're going to go through what it costs to get into real estate. To get licensed might cost a thousand dollars, and then depending on the path you take after that, it might cost another couple of grand. Right? I'm going to go through that now. I was asked a question about commercial. It's the same license, right? Getting the real estate license would allow you to do commercial real estate, which we do, or residential real estate. It's the same license. So, what do you need to succeed? A goal would be nice. 
A plan, a schedule, training, coaching, tools, and systems. Those are some of the basic components. I'll give you an example of how this might work. If you like the idea of making $300,000 in gross income, which in our market would be $12 million transactions. So one transaction a month for 12 months would produce $300,000 in gross commission income. So the question is, well, how do I get a transaction a month? And the metric that we would look at is appointments. So you have to have an appointment, a sort of what formal or semi-formal discussion with somebody who's thinking about buying or selling or investing in real estate. You need to have a, an appointment type, type of a conversation with them in order to have a sale. Now, it may not be a one-to-one -one ratio, right? One appointment always means one sale. It might not even be a two-to-one ratio. It might, let's just be conservative and say it's a four to one ratio, which would mean you're going to need four appointments at the beginning in order to get one client who closes a transaction. So if you want to close 12 transactions, you would need 48 appointments. That would mean you need one appointment a week for 48 weeks. You can take a month off, right? You're in real estate. You can take a month off. So if you had one appointment a week, for 48 weeks, and you converted 25% of those, you would make $300,000 in gross commission income in our market and go out looking for a new Tesla, something like that. So, all right, appointment a week, that doesn't sound so hard, does it? One appointment a week. So now the question is, is well, how do I get an appointment a week? And the answer is, you're going to have, you're gonna have to have conversations with people about buying, selling, or investing. How many? might you need to have, your mileage may vary, but let's say you need 50 conversations with buyers, sellers, or investors before you get an appointment. And you need four appointments before you close a transaction. What that comes out to is that you would need to have 10 conversations a day with people about buying, selling, or investing in real estate, 10 a day. And if you did that five days a week, that would be 50 a week, which should produce one appointment a week, which should produce 12 transactions, if you had one appointment a week. All right, 50 conversations, 10 people a day. Who do I talk to? Well, you start by talking to the people you know. Why? Because you know them. And somebody that you know or somebody that they know may be interested in buying, selling, or investing in real estate. Well, then what? You talk to people you don't know. And you probably are going to need to do that because you probably don't know enough people to make a career just out of talking to them. So you and we're gonna we would train you on all the different ways of talking to the people that you don't know. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to door knock or cold call. It doesn't necessarily mean that. I, we're much bigger on building relationships. This is something we know. 40% of real estate transactions, roughly, come from referrals from family, friends, coworkers, or others like that. 40% come from referrals. How many, what percent comes from door knocking or cold calling? About 4%. So there's a lot more in the, let's get a referral-based business going, than there is in just door knocking, cold calling, or having conversations. Now, you should be maybe doing everything at the beginning, depending on how much money you would like to make. So now you need to identify who you're going to talk to and what are you going to say, and we have training for all of that stuff, as well as coaching and the tools and systems that you need in order to be successful. This is an example of what a daily schedule for realtor, realtors real estate agents might look like. Right? It's just a typical one. And it's it's good in that it, it shows you some of the, the, the things that real estate agents would be doing to each day. Notice it says from 8 to 8.30 would be lead generation prep, where you'd be preparing your, your contacts and any scripts and materials and any practice that you might want to do. Right. And then between 11.30, 8.30 and 11 is when you would actually be doing this, talking to the people you know. There's something called geographic farming, expired listings for sale by owners, just listed, just sold, and a whole bunch of other 
business generation activities. Then there's business servicing that's over on the other side where you'd be responding to emails and texts and calls. Um, so there, there's a lot of administrative stuff that goes on. You even get a, a lunch break. And then lead conversion is where we would be following up with people that we've talked to in the past. There's an old saying, the fortune is in the follow-up. And what we know is, is that about 70% of all real estate transactions come not from the initial contact with somebody, but from following up with people that you've already contacted. Two to three, we're back to servicing, responding to emails. You get a lot of emails, mm -hmm. texts, phone calls, also buyers and sellers and listings and that. And then later in the afternoon or evening, you'd be having showing appointments, uh, listing appointments, showing property. And even at six o'clock, you could have some family time that it might be different if you're doing it part time it would it, our plan would involve some different steps but this is not a bad example of what a full time real estate agent schedule might look like there's a relationship between commissions and service which you just have to be careful of many offices charge very large monthly fees so hundreds of dollars a month 400 500 dollars a month um, there are offices that pay really high commissions, but then they won't do anything to help you. That doesn't necessarily work so well when you're getting started. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So how's the market? Well, not banned, right? Actually, sales in our area are up. Sales in California are up. Sales in the United States are up. If you're not from Silicon Valley or California, there's a good chance that wherever you're from, sales are up. This is just an example. Notice California has broken the median price of $700,000, which by the way, in Silicon Valley is more around the cost of a townhouse or a condominium. Um, this is just an example in California of August year over years. We have a we're doing September, it takes a little while for them to aggregate all of this. But you can see that just for the San Francisco Bay Area, which includes the nine counties that are, well, there's a list down below. You can see that over year to year the uh, change um, versus uh, how many sales were there and whether or not prices went up. So the pricing Prices went up on average in the Bay Area 18.7% year over year. 18% is how much prices have risen in the Bay Area. And the sales on average were up a little over 10%. Right? Uh, I'm just saying. Um, how about the future? Well, new forecasts are seeing the peak sales through fall stay above pre-pandemic levels through the coming year. That is a forecast by economists at Zillow. Sales are expected to stay high through 2021. Right? Price outlook is still looks like it's going to increase next year, although it may not be 18%. Um, the, now, could this not turn out that way? Of course, right? You know, it's very difficult to predict the future. Um, so how we handle the eviction crisis and a mortgage crisis and other economic things that are going on and stimulus packages and inflation and things like that, all of that's going to have an effect on our market ahead. But right now, it seems like um, we have a lot of demand. So, so far, the housing market is beating last year. Um, back in March, when the COVID thing was just beginning, Forecasts were dire, everything was going to fall apart. It was going to, you know. Um, but six months later, the market seems to have fully recovered. According to the National Association of Realtors pending sales report, their chief economist, Lawrence Yoon, um, his forecast, notice the last one, for 2021 was even more optimistic. Home sales will ramp up again next year, right? 2021, increasing between 8 and 12%. All right, so you can make a lot of money in real estate. You just need to be able to talk to people and follow up with people. You need to be able to, to handle transactions and that sort of thing. Uh, the market is pretty strong and it doesn't appear to be dying. So this might be a, a promising time to get into the real estate business. Now the question is, well, with whom? 
And the company that we represent is called EXP Realty, which is um, one of the larger real estate companies in the United States. And we're gonna quickly go through just a little bit of who we are and how the model works. EXP has been growing, well, pretty fast, right? Agent count is now, it says more than 34,000 as of September 4th in 50 US states, seven Canadian provinces. You can see that trajectory. And the innovation that EXP brought is the kind of innovation we've seen a lot from Silicon Valley. Um, there was a time, right, when you wanted to watch a movie, right? You'd go to Blockbuster, right? You'd get one of the CDs, you know, take it home, a v VCR, and, and play it. There was a time, by the way, where Blockbuster had an opportunity to buy Netflix when Netflix was just getting started and they passed. Blockbuster said, Netflix, you guys aren't going to make it. We understand at Blockbuster how to sell movies. Well, we can see how that turned out, right? People don't buy CD-ROMs or watch the movies and, and, and VCRs. Circuit City, anybody remember Circuit City, right? That's where you'd go to buy stuff, you know, electronic things. Now people go to Amazon. And what we're talking about is the movement from the traditional brick and mortar to the cloud, to the, the online marketplace. And traditional real estate brokerages, which have basically been like blockbusters or circuit cities and the old brick and mortar format, EXP is the Amazon or the Netflix of real estate brokerage. So first of all, it's a brokerage and not a franchise. Franchising, by the way, and my background, just a teensy bit, I worked for an embarrassingly long time, I mean a really long time, for a company called Century 21. And the company, by the way, that owns Century 21 also owns Coldwell Banker, ERA, Sotheby's, Better Homes and Gardens, Klein Realty, Zip Realty, and I'm sure I've left one out, right? It's a big group. And those are franchises. I also spent seven years at a company called Keller Williams, also a franchise. Now, that's not necessarily a new system for expanding a business. Um, they have brick and mortar, there's a lot of overhead, you're confined very locally, and there is limited technology. EXP is a cloud-based environment. We have live training, I mean, I'm sort of alive, um, but more than 50 hours a week, real-time support, international collaboration, and there's equity opportunities. So we have a cloud campus environment, which means we don't have desk fees. We also don't have desks, right? Um, you can work from anywhere. And by eliminating the brick and mortar overhead, it means that there are no expensive leases, there are less expenses, and there's more ability for our associates to profit. Um, live training, more than 50 hours on all the different aspects of being successful in real estate. And in addition to the how to get sales and listings and how to generate leads and how to use social media, CRM stands for a customer relationship management and software and technology used to follow up with people. In addition to all of that, we also have localized trainings in, in virtually every market every week in addition. Real-time support, you have a technology problem, an accounting problem, any kind of a problem, that's all available online uh, pretty much during, you can see 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time um, and e easy to get support. We're an international company and so there's international collaboration. Does real estate, does money that is buying real estate move across state lines as well as international borders? And well, the answer is yes. And you can have an opportunity of connecting with people in other states as well as in other countries, which is a powerful referral base. And you can see those are some of the countries that we're in and a growing number of them. One of the things that really attracts us to the, the model that EXP has is equity opportunities. And what a um, that means you can own stock in the company. 
Now, most real estate companies, that's not really, you know, that's not really a thing. There's a, a group out here called Intero, and Intero is owned by a company called Berkshire Hathaway, um, which you may have heard of. That's Warren Buffett's company. Warren Buffett owns Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway owns real estate offices in Intero. Do you understand that Warren Buffett is not cutting you in on any of the profits of the office? Right, an ownership interest by you as a real estate salesperson is out of the question. If you're at a Keller Williams or a Remax or a Cobalt Banker or a Century 21 or a Berkshire Hathaway, you understand they're not letting you invest. I don't know how much money you have, but Warren Buffett probably doesn't need it, right? But however, at EXP, what we want to encourage our agents to do is to become stockholders. And so you can earn shares on your transactions. You can buy shares at a discounted amount and um, you can be in an equity program where every time you close the transaction, you get a 10% discount and you get to build up stock ownership. You have to look at how the stock has done in the last year for EXP. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. You also get a voice in the company. We have an agent advisory council that participates in decision making. I've been in a lot of real estate offices. Generally, you don't get to participate in decision making, right? Most real estate companies is a top down. The broker is the boss, right? It's my way or the highway, right? There are some offices, they move locations, they change stuff. They, need, they don't even ask the agents how you feel about that. That doesn't happen in this kind of environment. We also have a revenue sharing plan. So as you earn commissions and people that you share this with earn commissions, we will cut you in on the amount of money. It's called company dollar, which is the money that the office gets. 50% of that money is given back to associates in revenue share. Let me say that one more time slowly. 50% of all the money that EXP receives from real estate transactions is paid back to associates through revenue sharing. We also have a virtual world, which means it's sort of like being on Zoom, but you don't have to, you know, don't have to do your hair, um, where it's a great learning environment, where it's a cloud campus where people can meet, um, it works on a cell phone, it's uh, where all of our administration is. So we're going to give you all of the software you need. We have another intranet by, um, called Workplace, which is by Facebook, marketing, branding, brochures, all of that sort of stuff. Um, if you Google search us, you'll see it's a very, we're a very popular company and we're a lot of it being written about it. The Motley Fool just did this long um, um, article about EXP and its stock growth. But you can see from uh, Real Trends calls this the Amazon of real estate. You can see the Amazon model, zero physical infrastructure, real estate. You're next. You get the idea. Now, in terms of of what how you get paid, because remember I was doing the example of a two and a half percent side produces twenty five thousand dollars in commission income. How is that split with the agent? Now, when you're first getting started on your first three transactions, you're going to be in a mentoring program because we have to drag you through your first three transactions. But the typical program is 80% to the agent and 20% to the office. Remember, 50% of what the office gets, they give back to agents. And it caps at $16,000. I'll give you an example. Let's say I sold an $800,000 house and it was a 2.5% side, either the listing side or the buyer side. That would be $20,000 in gross commission income. In that transaction, I would get 80% and the office would get 20% or $4,000, 20% of the $20,000. So after $4,000, four of those transactions, after four of those transactions, the, off, the total that would have been paid to the office is $16,000. You're capped at that for that year. In other words, the fifth transaction, you get 100%, sixth transaction, 100%, seventh transaction, 100%. How about this? If you did 40 transactions at a million dollar price point, I can do that math, 
If you did 40 of those transactions, you would have grossed $1 million in commission income. EXP would take only 16,000. You understand that is the maximum amount that you would ever pay in one year. And remember, 8,000 of the 16,000 is given back in revenue share. Um, we are the number five real estate company in the United States by agent count, number seven by sales volume, number five by transaction size, number two by volume increase. We're one of the top independents. You get the idea, we're big enough. Well, how do you get started? Now, I'm gonna focus on getting a real estate license in California. However, the process is pretty much the same in other states. If you're interested in finding out about that, it's similar, more similar than it is different. You can call me or talk to me. I have programs for other states. I've been licensed in other states as well. So the process is you have to do three things. One is you have to complete college level courses. That doesn't mean you have to go to college. Right, that's all included in our package. And in California, you need to complete three 45 hour college level courses. Step two is you have to take a test given by the State Department of Real Estate and you have to pass it. Step three is you can then apply and get a salesperson's license. So before you can take the state exam, you have to complete a college level course in real estate principles, a college level course in real estate practices, and you have to complete an elective. Now the elective could come from anything on this list. And I would point out that on this list is accounting, economics, they'll take any economics by the way, it doesn't have to be real estate, and business law. Now the reason I'm highlighting those three is because let's say you've ever, if you've ever taken accounting, economics, or business law from a junior college or better, you have the elective course. All you have to do is get your hand on a copy of the transcript. It doesn't have to be an original. This isn't like applying to Harvard or anything like that. Now, I've had people say, well, I've got all three of them, accounting, economics, and business law. Only one from this list will help you. You, you need real estate principles, real estate practice, and one from this list. If you're saying, but I don't have any of those, what am I going to do? Well, included in our package is the legal aspects of real estate, which is also known as real estate law. And I recommend to you, even if you've got accounting, economics, and business law, you're going to be given access to the real estate law class, and you ought to take it. And the reason you ought to take it is because the Department of Real Estate is not going to ask you questions on the licensing exam about economics, business law, or accounting. But they're going to ask a lot of questions about real estate law. So how would you get these college level courses? Well, um, I, I may even stop this slide because people aren't going to college anymore very often to do this. And there were some courses that were being taught live in offices. Um, our program is an online program. And the way an online college level course works is like this. You enroll in the course. After 18 days, you're eligible to take the first final exam. You don't have to take the first final exam in 18 days. That would be real estate principles. But you're eligible. The point is you can't take the final exam until at least 18 days has elapsed from the day you started the course. So you've paid, you've enrolled, you log into the course, you hit start. That's important because that's when the timer starts ticking. And then in 18 days, you could take the final exam. But the final exam for the three college level courses is an online final exam. You can take the final exam at home and it's an open book test let me go over that one more time the final exams for the three college level courses are online at home open book you can cheat as much as you want to you can cheat as much as you want you get three hours to get 75 out of 100 questions right did i mention that this is an open book test the reason the Department of Real Estate makes you wait 18 days to take it is because you could pass right now. We give you the book 
and give you three hours, right, with an internet connection and a cell, you could find 75 answers just by starting cold and looking them up on the internet or going through the textbook. Yeah, you understand that make the whole thing look like, you know, kind of ridiculous. So you have to wait 18 days to take the final exam. Online, open book, at home, cheat as much as you want. I hope you realize that what I've described so far is probably not the hard part of getting a real estate license, probably not. Because once you've done the three college level courses, now you can go take the state exam. And the state exam is not an online test and you can't take it at home. And it's not an open book test. You have to go in California to one of the locations of the Department of Real Estate to take the test. Those locations are Oakland, Sacramento, Fresno, there's a Los Angeles, it's really in Orange County, they call it Los Angeles area, and San Diego. That's it, right? You may have seen about bar exams and things that are being done on Zoom or whatever. The Department of Real Estate's not doing that, right? They're, they're paranoid that you're, you're really cheating. You, you understand you have to go to one of their centers to take the exam. It's not an open book test. They're watching you. If they see you cheating, they'll, they'll throw you out. It's a hundred, the state exam is 150 multiple guess, I, I mean multiple choice questions. A, B, C, D, pick the best answer. No true, false, no essay, no fill in the blanks. Out of those 150 questions, you have to get 70% of them right in order to pass the exam, 70%. Does 70% sound like a particularly high score to require? Is that a high score to require? Let's say you're laying on the operating table and your brain surgeon comes in, pulling on his gloves. And he says, look, I may be new, but don't worry. I passed the brain surgeon's exam. I got 70% of those questions, right? I nailed that test. Would, would that worry you, right? 70%, does that sound like a good score for a brain surgeon? Right, you, you understand at 70%, what that means is that your brain surgeon missed more then one out of every four questions they were asked about the subject of brain surgery, that doesn't sound very good, right? So the point I'm trying to make is you don't have to be a brain surgeon to get a real estate license. Did you already know that? You don't have to be a brain surgeon to get a real estate license. All you have to do is get 70% right and you're in. Having said that, however, Every time the state gives this exam, they fail more than half the people in the room, and many of those people, they have failed before. You can take the test an unlimited number of times. I have met too many people that have taken the test more than 10 times. So every time they give the test, they fail more than 50% of the people in the room. Many they have failed before, Failure for first time takers is closer to 70% than 50, but you can take it again and again and again. So all these people that are failing, right? The 70% nearly that fail on the first try, the more than 50% that fail every time they give the test. Of all those people that are failing the real estate exam, how many of them do you think were able to successfully complete those three online, open book, cheat as much as you want to college courses. How many of them were able to get through those three college courses? And the answer is they all did. They all were able to do that because you can't even take this exam unless you've done the three college courses. You see, my point is that doing the three college courses does not mean you're getting a real estate license. Doing the three college courses only means that you have the, you've done the minimum amount to go take a shot at the real estate exam. But obviously for most people, that's not enough. What I do is I teach people how to pass the test. I have 12 live classes. You can start with any one. You can take them in any order. You can repeat them as often as you can stand it. They're on Wednesday evenings from 6.30 to about 8.45. They're webinar. They're recorded. You can watch the recordings. They're live in somewhat interactive webinars. It's in a rotating class schedule. I tell people it's like, it's like a pizza like a, because they're, it, it's warm and cheesy. or or it's like a pizza because there is no first slice to a pizza, right? Isn't that true? I mean, if your friend said, uh, go ahead, you know, dig in, you know, here's the pizza. And you said, oh, which is the first piece? 
that they would think something is wrong with you. There is no first piece to a pizza. There's just 12 pieces. So my point is, is that my classes are taught as independent modules. They don't build on each other. There's no first class. You could start with anyone in the cycle. You could take them in any order. You can repeat them, well, as often as you can stand them. What does it cost to get through this process? The answer is $398. That includes the 12 live classes and the video replays and an extensive outline and a really extensive practice testing program. It includes the three college level courses that you need and a cram class, I think is the technical term for it, before a workshop before you go take the exam, which is held on Saturday. How long does this process take? Three and a half to six months. It takes you 18 days minimum to do each of the college level courses. And they, 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 they have to be consecutive. You can't do them simultaneously. In other words, if you need to do all three and you're doing them as fast as possible, it's gonna be 18 days each or 54 days total minimum to do the three college courses. Only then can you apply to take the state exam, and that's going to take between two. It used to, for a while, it was like six months because they weren't giving tests in Oakland, and you know there was, there was a virus, right? And things were way behind. But it, in normal markets, will take about a, two additional months, right? From the time you finish the college courses, at least two more months before you're actually taking the state exam. Your license is good for four years, and every four years you have to take. 45 hours of continuing education and um, pay a renewal fee every four years. There, here's some information about us, email, uh, phone number, our website. What I recommend that you do if you're interested is come and sit through a class. There's no cost or obligation. That way you can see you know, if you like it or not. Um, this is a little bit about my Yelp reviews. I had stopped advertising in Yelp a couple of years ago. And so they filtered over a hundred five-star reviews off of my Yelp page, which they said had nothing to do with me not advertising anymore. It was just a coincidence, just a coincidence. But this is a screenshot from back then. Um, I still have a lot of good Yelp reviews, but they filtered most of the five-star reviews. And so I'm showing you the good and the bad and the ugly, right? This is full transparency. You can see, you can see, that I've received a four-star review. Um, and we have a, well, so uh, Josephina, let's talk a little bit uh, about that. Josephina says that she has a real estate license and was selling timeshares. Uh, um, and how do you get started with EXP will be, uh, why don't we talk either afterwards today or tomorrow, I'll send you a, a an invitation so we can set up a time to talk about how to move forward. But anyhow, you can see I've, I've received one four-star review in all the years that I've been doing this. And if you look at my Yelp page right now, that's like 50 or so reviews. Um, if you find the filtered reviews, you're gonna find a couple of hundred more five-star reviews. There's still only one four-star review. And I'll tell you this, given my relationship with, with Yelp, if I had any bad reviews, they certainly would be showing them to you because they would like to. Um, what I would recommend that you do is to try a guest lesson. So if you go to my website, which is dreclass.com, this is for California, um, and you click on the button that says free guest lesson, and then you fill out that form, Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, or it could be next Wednesday, if you're busy this Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, you can uh, check out a class, right? See what one is like, no cost, no obligation. Um, if you wanna sign up now, and I wouldn't stop you from doing that, you could click on the button, sign up now, and there's really only one choice. And when you fill out that form and pay us, you'd be enrolled in the course. Are there any, um, any questions? Any questions? All right. I don't see any right now. Um, what if you've already have courses completed and you just need the cram course? The cram course only costs $49.
and I would encourage you to come and sit through my Wednesday class anyhow, and then see what you think of it. It won't cost you anything, but the Saturday workshop is only $49. I have an upgrade also for people that need more help than just the Saturday workshop, which James, you can reach out to me and we can talk about that. Any other questions? Don't see any. All right. Absent any more questions, I'm going to call it an evening. Thank you very much for spending the time with us. We really appreciate it. Reach out to us um, if you have any more questions. I'll reach out both to James and to Josephina to um, let you know what we can do to move forward and make an appointment to talk if you'd like. All right, that's all I got. Thank you all. Good night.